Look at this. This is a natural gas pipe that I just pulled out of my house, the building that we're sitting in right now. I knew I had seen some pitting and some corrosion, but I didn't realize just how bad it was. Now this pipe is about 50 years old, which is probably pretty common for the age of natural gas pipes around the country. And it has me a little worried because while natural gas is seen as a bridge fuel and the cleaner alternative to coal, it poses some serious challenges being an odorless and lighter than air gas. So in this episode, I wanted to see the entire flow of how natural gas is produced, how it gets to your house, and just how dangerous it might be. So let's see if we can't figure this out together. I'm Ricky, and this is Stupid Da Vinci. This video is brought to you by Brazil Potash. So here's a chart of energy consumption by source here in the US. And you can see coal was on the rise until, like I mentioned, about 15 years ago, and it has seen a sharp, sharp decline. Now, a lot of detractors have said that coal is dying, especially people in coal-rich states like West Virginia, thanks to renewable energy. But that's not the case, because in this same time frame, actually quite literally, you can see how natural gas has been on the rise. But unlike coal, natural gas has some challenges being a gas. If some coal rock were to fall off of a train, it just falls by the side of the road. But methane, which is what's in natural gas, is lighter than air, it's odorless, and it could seep out and cause some damage. So the original sales pitch for natural gas is that it has about half the carbon dioxide production of coal when burnt for fuel, and that's true. But if natural gas seeps out in places before it's used, a lot of those benefits are completely wiped out. It was the oil companies that first started touting the benefits of natural gas as a source of energy. Before that, coal was the predominant player in most parts of the world. And interestingly, if you've ever seen an oil well and you ever see that controlled little flame at the top, that's natural gas being ignited. That way it's not just leaking into the air because most companies are fined for leakages in natural gas. So while early on, natural gas was literally just ignited and wasted, the oil companies realized that would be another source of revenue that they weren't tapping into. And this started the campaign to sell natural gas as the clean, safe way of energy independence. The oil company spent billions touting natural gas as the bridge fuel because they knew that eventually we would run out. In fact, most of the oil wells that were dug over the last 100 years have gone dry. We've had to get clever with fracking and different ways of extracting harder to reach oil as most of the easy to reach oil has already been extracted. So people know that oil and gas won't last forever and we need a bridge fuel and natural gas fit the bill. Natural gas is mostly methane, a potent greenhouse gas that has the potential to trap in the heat coming from the sun. In fact, it has the power to trap in about 80 times as much heat as carbon dioxide over a 20 year period. While it's true that natural gas does only contribute about half the CO2 of burning coal, there's leakages all along the way from where it's extracted to the pump stations, through the pipelines, to the final destinations where they're actually used. And that natural gas in the atmosphere could be pretty harmful. But the rise in natural gas popularity really coincides very closely with the rise of fracking. Hydraulic fracturing or fracking is the process of drilling vast networks of pipe and blasting with high pressure water to fracture the rock and release the natural gas that's housed within it. When this happened, they realized that along with the oil, the natural gas was also a commodity that they can make money on. Fracking put natural gas on the map and boosted the US to slowly over time become the number one exporter of natural gas. Here's a look at the largest exporting countries of natural gas. And looking at this graph, you'll see the two different colors. The light blue here is pipeline export. And over here on the right is LNG or liquid natural gas. These are the two ways that natural gas is sold as commodity, either compressed as compressed natural gas and pumped through pipelines or liquefied, brought down in temperature until natural gas becomes a liquid and sold as a liquid. How about this? How can we minimize deforestation and still feed a growing population? By producing more high quality fertilizer and making existing farmland more productive. And that is the mission of our sponsor this week, Brazil Potash. Brazil Potash is a world-class resource development company focused on sustainable potash production in Brazil, a country that currently imports 98% of its potash. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the three primary nutrients in fertilizer, are critical for agriculture. And Brazil has both a large population to feed and the world's largest rainforest, the Amazon, to preserve. 
Driving Brazil's potash success is Mayo Schmidt, a veteran leader with a track record of creating agricultural powerhouses. Their Autazis project taps into an ancient ocean basin beneath the Amazon with high concentrations of potassium and saline rock, offering a new source of sustainable and cost-effective potash production. Their novel approach to responsibly sourcing potash can help us increase yields on existing farmland without having to increase deforestation in the pursuit of new ones. Having recently rung the bell at the New York Stock Exchange and going public, they're ready to take the next steps in building out their mining operations for potash extraction and processing. Learn more today about Brazil Potash and their novel projects using our links in the description. Huge thanks to Brazil Potash and you. Now back to the show. Let's start with pipelines. Pipelines are critical for making natural gas transport economical, as it's less dense than liquid fuels like gasoline. The U.S. is home to nearly 3 million miles of natural gas pipeline, taking it from the remote locations like the Permian Basin and pumping it through stations, compressors, and bringing it to the points where it's actually used. Now, the entire system of building pipelines is incredibly complicated. It requires establishing easements over other people's lands. Not all the land the pipes run on is actually owned by these pipeline operators, but the easements give them the right to run pipelines and to maintain it and to keep it safe for operation. The construction process of building these pipelines is pretty straightforward. They trench and dig, and then the pipe sections are laid out, bent to fit the terrain, and welded together. And they're inspected for integrity. As you can imagine, any leaks would be a major problem. These pipes are placed on sandbags, covered with softer, and then backfilled and tested with high pressure water. Crews can install about a mile of pipe per day under ideal conditions. But like all gases running through a pipe, you're gonna lose pressure over time. And that's why you have compressor stations. Now, these stations compress natural gas to between 500 and 1400 pounds per square inch, propelling it through the pipes at around 40 kilometers an hour, around 25 miles an hour. This compression reduces the gas's volume, making it easier and more viable to transport. But it also makes any sort of leak more prevalent. So this is a map of the pipelines that run here just in the US. And you can see large densities where the natural gas is actually exported and extracted from the ground, and then where it's pumped to the population centers that need it. Now, natural gas is famously one of the most volatile commodities there is, and that's because the need for natural gas is incredibly variable. Natural gas is needed most in the winter when you need it for heating, for example. So during the summer, you have to store it, and it's stored in depleted underground caverns, in much the same way that it was originally extracted. Depleted underground caverns provide a copious space to be able to pump the natural gas into and to be able to preserve it and keep it for when it's needed later on. They also use existing salt caverns and even drained aquifers. Over 400 storage sites exist across the US often spanning thousands of acres. The second way natural gas is consumed is as a liquid or LNG, liquefied natural gas. To produce LNG, you have to cool natural gas to around negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 160 degrees Celsius, shrinking it to about one six hundredth of its gaseous volume for efficient transport. Compared to compressed natural gas, this is even more efficient. Now, the global trade of natural gas happens via shipping of very specialized tankers that take the LNG and ship it to the countries that need it. Markets like China, Japan, and South Korea, which lack sufficient domestic supply and use it in massive quantities. In fact, when I was in Japan, I noticed a lot of the taxis ran on LNG. When you put your bag in the trunk, you'd see a little canister and it said LNG on it. That's how they ran their trucks. Here in the US, a lot of larger buses waste disposal trucks run actually on LNG as well. But of course, these ships, these tankers for LNG are costly to build and very specialized only for one purpose. And again, they have to burn some of that LNG to make the transit across the oceans to where they're needed in a very wasteful process. And liquefaction facilities are really expensive. The Sabine Pass in Louisiana cost around 17 to $21 billion to build, and it cools and purifies the gas to produce LNG. And here just in the US, there's plans underway to build even more liquefaction stations to increase our exports even further. But one of the themes you're gonna hear on this channel time and time again is why it's really important to bet on the right technology, especially for long lead time things like liquefaction stations or power plants, because this technology has got to be in demand 10 years from now when these things come online. And that 
is an interesting question that we'll get back to here in a second. But before we get into why LNG's best days were probably behind it, let's go back to pipelines here for a second. I actually remember this story really closely because I have a lot of family in San Bruno, California. And in 2010, an electrical failure sent high pressure gas into an old faulty pipeline and made a deadly fireball that killed eight people and destroyed 38 homes. And this scared me to death because while electricity is also dangerous, we have circuit breakers that would trip if something were to happen. There's no real protection that way in terms of natural gas. Now, like electricity, natural gas is pumped in much the same way as electricity, where you have high voltage lines that then go through transformers, step it down to low voltage for actual consumption in homes. But like I mentioned, how much of our aging infrastructure probably looks like this. This is a galvanized pipe, but a lot of pipe is either cast iron or galvanized steel, and either way, it corrodes in the earth. This, you can clearly tell where it was buried under the ground. This part stood up, and this part was buried. There were a couple of points where I think there might have been a leak, maybe, but if it was underground and contained closely enough, it might not have been a problem. But here in the U.S., about 286 serious natural gas explosions happen per year that cause over $50,000 worth of damage, severe injury, or loss of life. And between 1998 and 2017, 15 people per year on average died in incidents related to natural gas distribution here in the U.S. Now, some of the reasons for this are maintenance related, like bad pipe valves that fail and high pressure natural gas is able to come down to homes where it's not supposed to, or human error where valves are being maintained or something and something goes wrong. But the question really is, What's the future of natural gas? Natural gas has served its point. I, I do think that there's been some value, but one of the big concerns is actually environmental. One of the things I was shocked to find out is just how common methane leaks are. Now you might be thinking, oh, the EPA or other regulatory agencies are monitoring this, but it turns out the responsibility to report a natural gas leak falls on the people operating the pipelines and the infrastructure. They have to self-report. So it turns out if you have a leak, of an odorless, invisible gas, you have two choices. You can either report and pay penalties or do nothing. But sometimes people do get caught. And there's a great video by a channel that I love called Climate Town, which we'll link to down below, where there was actually a instrument in the air monitoring for methane, and they saw plumes of methane coming out. You would need like a spectrum analyzer to see methane. This is kind of how we detect trace elements of different gases and elements on other planets as well. So that was in the air and noticed there was a leak. And when they told the people about it, shockingly, two days later, they said, oh yeah, we want to report a leak. But this probably happens more than you realize. Just imagine highly compressed gases. This is what makes hydrogen also difficult to deal with. Gases are notoriously difficult to maintain and to keep contained. But imagine over the 3 million miles of natural gas pipeline, just how much leakage there actually is. I had some viewers tell me to check out a new TV show called Landman with one of my favorite actors, Billy Bob Thornton, and I've just started watching it, but already in episodes one and two, one thing is really clear, high pressure natural gas that's able to escape the ground and shoot up in high pressures is in an unbelievable danger, especially if it's ignited and combusted. And this is what we're contending with. But I'm actually not in favor of banning it or anything like that. Here's what I think we should be thinking about. Natural gas has value. It's incredibly easy to store and use when you need it. In the case that you have cloudy days, it'd be amazing to have a natural gas power plant that you can turn on and off as you need. But I don't think we should be burning natural gas as a first option. It should be the backup option. Also, the days of running natural gas to individual homes probably are numbered. I don't know that it makes sense anymore. With heat pumps, we can now produce energy at really high efficiencies with electricity that we already have running to our homes. The one utility that we will always have is electricity. There's no replacement for it, right? There's no replacement for electricity. But what if we could heat our homes, heat our water with heat pump systems, which we can already do, especially in the states that don't get that cold, the South, for example. Maybe we should run natural gas to northern states or to in Canada, for example, places where the winters are really, really severe. Even though heat pumps have made huge strides in really low temperature operations, maybe we conserve natural gas for those use cases. Here in San Diego, I really don't see any reason why we have to have natural gas running to our homes. Most of the world has already moved in this direction. The U.S. is a bit behind because 
we have huge amounts of natural gas and with subsidies, we've made them very cheap. But if we can make electricity even cheaper and we can make heat pumps even cheaper, then we can put this aging bridge technology fine to rest and move into a purely electrical age. All right. I'm sure this will get a lot of comments and stuff. Let me know what you think below. Do you have worries? Do you have concerns about what runs in your neighborhood? What do the pipes look like? How old are they? Uh, sound off in the comments below. And if you think I've earned it, subscribe. We have a lot of really cool content coming up. I'm going to slowly phase out all natural gas in our house. And if you want to learn more about all the things that we have coming up, we'd love for you to join the ride. Hit this bell icon notifications and leave us your comments. And if you thought this video was interesting, check out this other video that I made about how the U.S. can't actually use the oil that it pumps, which you might find interesting as well. And until next week, I'm Rico Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.